I had to do this. We were doing a memorial for one of our guys. Actually, the guy from uh, Bob from Globusters, he passed away recently. I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, did everything go well with that service? I saw that, that there was a memorial on Sunday. Yeah, it did. It did. Okay. And um, uh, it was it was it wasn't something. God, I swear to God. Hang on one second. I got to let me do this. I'm going to kill the video and then bring it back. There we go. There it is. So, yeah. And if I if I turn into transparent mode, let me know. Um he, he had a he had a long term um heart condition. Long term. Okay. I mean he was he was born in 60, so he'd be 64 and or 63. And uh it was a he was one of those guys kind of like me. Yeah, I don't like doctors. <laughs> Most of our community does not do doctors, really. Sure. And so uh he decided no, it's like nope, I'm gonna you know, deal with this at home best I can, quality of life type deal. And that was it. And we kept it under wraps. We didn't mm-hmm. want to, you know, until it's happened, it hasn't happened, as my late father told me a long time ago. So, yeah, but it went well. It went, a lot of people uh, showed up and talked and uh, it was good. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And, and, you know, I said in my email, but wanted to offer condolences. And um, yeah, thank you. so I'm just, I'm just glad that the service went well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Where do you want to start? Well, um, you know, I want to make things a little bit more interesting. I know you've been interviewed to death and uh, want to, you know, uh, jump in with some of the generic stuff and then move on to something a little oh, bit more interesting. We can, so whatever, nothing's off limits. Well, I mean, you're a teacher, so I imagine there's something, off <laughs> but nothing, nothing's off limits for me. So uh, you shoot and uh, we'll do it. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, so generic oh, stuff. By the, off by the, the way, bat. This, is a, this is a middle school in Texas, right? Yes, it is a it's a K twelve school in Texas, and so I teach seventh grade up through high school seniors. Private school, yes. Oh, well, fancy. And you made the you made them. And by the way, I am amazed how much traction you know behind the curve was shot back in twenty seventeen, mm-hmm. and I'm amazed how many schools just like yours will call me after they've made the students watch behind the curve. Mm-hmm. And I told people, you know, because our community hates it. Just I, I don't know if that's one of your questions. They hate it. Because you sure. know, there's, there's opposing views. I'm going, look, it's okay to have opposing views. And I say, but what will happen is you will give people the chance to watch it. Otherwise, wouldn't because now it's basically mass media endorsed mm-hmm. You know, by Netflix. I, so. it, it, it sure seems like it pushed it into the mainstream in a way that oh, yeah. it wasn't before. And, and that that's kind of interesting because I, I, I'm not surprised that most people who are active in that community – aren't a fan. I think it, uh, you know, I was curious to hear your thoughts on how well you thought it represented um, the community, but I have seen that you've put it in your YouTube bio and things like that, kind of directing people to it. Is that mostly about just that idea of let's get it in as many people's kind of minds thinking about it as possible or the saying is uh, the the saying that most people incorrectly use, but, but it's more popular is uh, uh, all press is good press. Mm -hmm. But that's not that's not the original saying. The original saying is even bad press is free, mm-hmm. which is you can't put a price tag. There's a clip. I'll give you a perfect example. There's a clip I use on my on my promo on my channel where LeBron James is asking Kyrie Irving about flat earth mm-hmm. right at, at a press conference at a, at a basketball thing. And people don't understand how what that took to do that, meaning. It's like I could have, you know, we could have solicited LeBron James over the course of a year and paid him $5 million. And even then he probably wouldn't have done it. Right. And he went out and came out and talked about it for free Mm -hmm. and recorded. It's like, you can't, you can't put a a sticker on that. So having a Netflix documentary, you know, having a documentary that was picked up by every, you know, and the producers had no faith in it at all. Uh, When it was picked up by um, Amazon and YouTube and iTunes and then finally Netflix. Mm -hmm. Netflix was the holdout. They were the last ones and finally they said, oh, we're going to own this thing. So when they did that, my email load, which was already pretty heavy, when it came out within that first month, my email load doubled. Right. Literally doubled because of that. And that's because I'd forgotten that for a lot of people under the age of 30, Netflix is still the biggest bang for your buck. That's mm-hmm. out there, you know, it was like 15 bucks a month for streaming. And now, you know, during the pan- pandemic, we all know what the value of streaming is. Mm-hmm. So, um, but anyway, yes, it was absolutely worth it. Uh, I wouldn't have changed really anything for, for me because I sat in the studio audiences during the film festivals and watched what happened. And sorry, I, I don't want to drag this out, but I watched, oh, you're good. I watched the people 
that thought it was it was a piece of docu fiction, if you know what that is. Meaning, mm-hmm. they thought it was a fake movie being played seriously. Mm-hmm. So for the first twenty or thirty minutes, the people in the audience was like, "Oh, laughing!" It's like, "Oh, this is pretty good, pretty dry stuff, right?" And all of a sudden, you could see it hit their faces, like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, this is real. Mm-hmm. This is actually ha- this is on the internet. This is actually happening right now." I mean, there was a, again a, a famous. Um, editor out of los angeles who was shown it absolutely with no context who thought who once he heard he goes what do you mean that conference happened and he goes, it's like no man like, we were there for like three days it's like what how is this even possible and that's again it's the it's, it was the shock value so mm-hmm. so anyway sorry no it, it makes sense though i mean you got to figure that a lot of people upon first viewing it or you know like you talked about in the documentary first hearing the idea at all probably think it's a practical joke of some yes. kind or something like that. That's... But you see how people's response changes when they realize this is a serious issue. People yeah. actually want to have conversations about it. The yeah, people yeah, yeah. want to share their opinions about it. And even just that, even if you haven't convinced most of that audience necessarily, or right off the bat, at least, you've at least gotten them speaking about it in a way that's not, oh, isn't that funny? You yeah, know? yeah. It became now, now, now when it's, when it's brought up with people, nobody looks at you like Flat Earth never heard about it. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, right, Flatter. Yeah, I've been doing this now for eight years. So Flatter, you know, oh, no, no, the discussion's gone everywhere. We're on every platform you can think of. And uh, the irony is is that just about every major, we've only got, in fact, I'm going to work this into my speech in October, which is most of our uh, channels barely even crack six figures. But all of the biggest YouTube channels in the world have done a Flat Earth video, and we never had to call them. Mm-hmm. They just decided to do it after looking. It's like, oh, this is this, you know, once it started trending, everybody jumped on it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's gonna be like a billion hits just in uh, in verified channels out there. And we never had to call a single one of them. They called us, which is right. you know, and, and our channels still don't get a lot of subs because because subs are public record, right? You can see who's sub to who. And so you didn't, you know, you, oh yeah, you may watch flat earth videos. You're gonna sub to a channel. I don't know about that. <laughs> You know, right. I, don't want, I don't want my friends to know. Right. Anyway, so. Well, so, you know, the documentary was in 2017. Um, yeah. It's hard to think that that's been six years at this point since, yeah. it, since it came out. Um, yeah. What do you feel like some of the more exciting kind of newer developments are? Because our conversations have all been wrapped up in what takes place in the context of preparing for that first conference. Most of it was, yeah, and that was standard documentary fare, right? You mm-hmm. take the protagonists and you say, you know, it's like, okay, here's all these people individually. Let's, you know, get the big finale into one big area. You know, some adversaries who didn't show up at the mm-hmm. at the. We have a hard time just getting people to uh, to oppose us publicly, you know, in, mm-hmm. in, you know, in, in the in our same space. But the things that have changed since then mostly have been, um, well, one celebrity endorsements, you know, different different people in different walks of life that have gotten into it. Law of averages says that if you if you canvas an area, you're going to get this many athletes and this many actors and this many, uh, you know, not necessarily politicians, but different different walks of life. So the the subject matter experts were were fun to see, you know, people from you know, branches of the armed forces, lots of lots of other tests that were done. Uh, but by the time you got to remember, by the time the conference came around, which was fall of 2017, we had already been doing stuff for a couple of years. So, you know, two two years and change. So a lot of it. Well, what we did was we did more conventions. After that, we did Denver and then Dallas and then a whole bunch of stuff in Europe and Canada. I mean, heck, in tw- before the pandemic in 2019, I w- I had done conferences in eight countries. Mm-hmm. That was the big thing. It wasn't necessarily the new experiments; it was the uh, just the the word spreading everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, to, to all the different platforms. Um, and then in 2020, uh, you know, all the borders shut down, mm-hmm. so we had stuck. It's like, oh crap! In fact, we couldn't even do national conferences because we couldn't find a venue you know this is not the crowd so venue says well yeah you guys can come but you gotta have to wear masks mm-hmm. and you know our crowds are like no <laughs> that's <laughs> that's not gonna work mm-hmm. and so we we couldn't do them and so like this year finally and so we were doing some in south carolina where we've actually found a venue it was like a uh um, one of the masons it was a shriner it was like a mason hall which is weird because you think, well, the Masons isn't that part of the whole conspiracy thing? It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. well, the enemy or my enemy is my friend, maybe. 
So that was our the excuse we used. But um, this year will be in Vegas. Finally, that was the one that was supposed to happen in 2020. So, yeah. So were there any that happened, you know, in the last few years with the pandemic or was it just 2020 that got canceled or, or has well, the, the international one, the conference big, come back? The, the big the big conference in Vegas was canceled in 2020. Okay. And then we did it was mostly an East Coast conference that was done in uh, South Carolina at that uh, the, the Mason Event Center or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And it, actually, the turnout was really good. Um, it was done by um, uh, a co-host of mine on a podcast, Karen B., and she did a wonderful job and she did it uh 20, 21, 22. And uh just did, I mean I went to the I went to the one in 20, didn't go to the one in 21, went to the one in 22. Uh it was it was great. And so and then the mandates finally got rolled back. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we we never stopped. Uh the you know, the numbers just kept piling up and piling up. You know, an app was built, uh the the flat earth sun, moon, and Zodiac. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, that's just an amazing app. That thing got built, and so then that started, you know, people networking. Uh, which was which was fun during the pandemic. Uh, other experiments were done, but mostly the experiments, you know, the most of the stuff that that get people involved in flat Earth are just a series of like three or four different experiments that anybody could do on their own. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't. <laughs> I will say this. Let, let me let me throw one more at you, which is um, Jaron. God bless him. You know, at the end of that movie, you know, the stinger that they, they right they did. Remember, it was supposed to be a human interest piece. That's all it was supposed to be. But when there was a part in the movie, and we didn't even know until I listened to the um, director's commentary on, it was only on iTunes of all things. There was a director's commentary where they were narrating. And when that 12 year old kid was asking me questions on stage, he was playing mm-hmm. hooky and asking me questions on stage. I think he was playing hooky. It might have been a Saturday. It doesn't really matter. He, <laughs> he was there. The, all of a sudden they're going, okay, this is when we, and the you know the producer and the director is like, oh, no, 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 we all, we had to take a stand against flat earth at this point. It's like, what? <laughs> Why? And, and they never told us. Uh, and it was because, well, you know, if you're influencing kids, you know, it's all fun and games. And, you know, so the kids are involved. It's like, yeah, I guess, but you know, we, it's not like we were dragging them in off the street. Mm-hmm. You know, they were there voluntarily. So, um, <laughs> Uh, but that's when that's when things changed. And so but they couldn't reshoot it. The point I'm getting is they couldn't reshoot it because most of the movie was already in the can. So they sure. had to do whatever they could. They twist bent it as much as they could during editing. So they took a shot at Bob. They took a shot at Jaron. They left Patricia alone because everybody leaves Patricia alone. Um, they even took a little shot at me with the, the green button scene. And even they asked me if they could mm. leave it in the film. I go, yeah, sure. I get I see what you did there. And that was a complete accident. Right. Where where I walked away from the thing, and if you know anything about camera stuff, they leave the camera running for an extra few seconds, you know, for for padding for for editing. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, "Hey, why don't we just cut out the part with with Mark? You know, because we left the camera on the green button. Why don't we just cut out the part where Mark was beating on it like a drum? You know, because mm-hmm. nothing worked in the freaking NASA place. It was like we, I was hitting. It's like was anything working on this thing? Mm-hmm. And all. And if you cut that part out, it makes me look like I never hit it." Right, because all you see, all we see is the screen, you know, right. being tapped as opposed to the button. Yeah, and, and I, of course, I was an idiot to even think in my wildest dreams that they would have touch touch screen technology <laughs> there. But that was my second choice. I mean, you couldn't miss it. It was one button and then mm-hmm. next to the seat. They literally could not miss it, and it was not working. But but so, I told but I told them to leave it in because it was a it got a good laugh. Right. So sure, why not? I've I've told people I go look. You could you could tie me in a chair and throw pies at me for an afternoon as long as I could actually get my you know the the flat Earth stuff out there. You can do it. I don't care. You know mm-hmm. it's I, and I've you know metaphorically done that in some interviews where they and we had you know kind of a preliminary conversation leading into the documentary where I had seen it before, but it had been a little while since I'd watched it before showing it to my classes, and I I was testing my memory sort of to see how well do I think it balances showcasing, you know, the humanity of all those involved, whether it's people from the flat earth community or the scientific community or whoever, um, with, you know, does it communicate an agenda or does it remain kind of neutral? And I, I, and so I was sort of testing my memory by rewatching it in advance of the class. And that was what I was curious to get my students perspective on was, you know, how do you think, uh, how do you think it represented the scientific community versus the flat earth community? Um, do you think it was, because this is a different question, neutral, balanced. I think those are different concepts. I, I don't think I would argue it was neutral, um, but but balanced is, is kind of the word that they were throwing out as like, well, you know, my students who, uh, who you know, were, were discussing 
the flat earth theory separate from the humans being discussed and and uh, as sort of the subject of the documentary right and for the most part their takeaway was well i didn't you know they were a couple cheap shots like the start button and things like that yeah. other than that they were like well hey for the most part other than moments like that i feel like most of these people you know and they mentioned you in particular yeah. uh come across as as reasonable intelligent rational kind of people who are looking for a discussion yeah. and whether or not they agree with the logic or anything is you know they they didn't feel like it was it was there to ex- exclusively make fun of one group over another but they're also not part of you know either of the communities being interviewed primarily so that's why they were curious well like hey we know what we think what does he think about this what does he right. think about how it how he was represented oh no 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 i thought i well one i thought it was balanced and i know why they would do it you know why they would do it like that i mean again it was blind luck that we would that they skewed it as much as they did in editing but because when i sat with the audiences and listened to it i felt you know there were two things one you know the producers and the direct director and, and everybody else had nothing to do with flat earth at all mm-hmm. absolutely and still to this day do not and that worked in their favor because when the film was done and they were on stage you know sitting ready to ask answer questions the first question almost invariably was are you guys flat earthers because they wanted to know if this was a propaganda piece and it's like well if you're flat earthers you're going to obviously you know spin it in a certain light but at the same time it was because it absolutely was not a propaganda piece i treated it kind of like the the flat earth drug which mm-hmm. was uh it was you know it wasn't pure uncut flat earth right and i could see the anxiety rise and fall in the audience almost mm-hmm. in real time where it's like okay there's flat earth there's flat earth. okay there's a scientist scientist okay we're, we're okay <laughs> flat earth, flat earth. hey oh there, there's a psychiatrist we're fine we're absolutely right. you, fine. it's like a built-in reality check or something yeah it is i mean you're just mm-hmm. going up and down and up and down by the time the 100 minutes are done i mean most people didn't even know what jaron had done wrong by the time mm-hmm. they, they got to the end of that film and it was it was kind of cool to see because again what I, you know if I, I ask the community what would you have changed well I would have pulled out the astronaut I would have pulled out the scientist and all it's like I go once you do that you know there is no hero's journey you know mm-hmm. there is no rise and fall you have to give it some sort of balance mm-hmm. and even the even the title behind the curve right which is which is a little dig you know it's a little dig mm-hmm. oh they're behind the curve right it even even though you know it's it's meant to be, you know, all, you know, the kind of, it's a dual reference, right. You know, behind the curve, but also behind, you know, the bell curve, mm-hmm. right. So there, the flat earthers might be a little slow, which made people safe, you know, it's, you know, f- felt safe to even introduce that, you know, to even take a look at it. It's like, well, they're obviously going to take some, make some fun at them. So it's okay. We're fine. You know, mm-hmm. if they called it flat earth, the glorious truth, nobody would have watched it. <laughs> no one would have watched it. Sure. Well, and I even, I mean, I had a couple of students be like, I- I'm not sure which angle this documentary is taking. Is it trying to promote Flat Earth? Is it trying to refute it? Is it doing neither? And that was one of the things we discussed is like, well, do we feel like it was agenda driven? If so, from what angle? Um, but, it you know, was, I think, it, oh, go ahead. I, I, I think the, the thing that uh, stuck out to me in their takeaways from the documentary was, Some of the people who, when I first asked, you know, we were looking not at one individual conspiracy theory as our only topic. It just so happened that Flat Earth was one of the more interesting kind of uh, case studies of what we were calling the conspiracy mindset. And so looking at that conspiracy mindset, how it can apply to different conspiracy theories um, of varying degrees of validity, uh, you know, do we what do we think are motivating factors that might lead people to these ideas and you know i had a couple who were like well they're probably dumb you know something like that and i was like well let's challenge that a little bit like let's yeah. let's get let's what, y'all are smarter all conspiracies than that are dumb? well and and so that's what i said is like you know y'all are smarter than that we're going to have a more in-depth conversation here where we're going to look at um what are factors outside of intelligence? Because I think when you watch the documentary, you're not going to see a bunch of idiots versus a bunch of geniuses clashing over the shape of the earth. You're going right. to see a variety of people of different levels of education, but for the most part, fairly educated, fairly intelligent with the right intentions, approaching it from different angles. And yeah. so that was kind of where from an outsider perspective, not being involved with the movement and not being in the scientific community, um, you know, teaching courses on on uh social science as opposed to you know the hard sciences like from an outsider perspective it felt like it wasn't communicating these are the idiots and these are the smart ones and yeah. let's watch them kind of bicker right. uh, it felt like it was deeper than that and th- so those are the sorts of conversations we were trying to have where it was like well 
I think there's a lot of factors that play into people being more or less likely to being drawn into certain conspiracies and conspiracy theories. Um, and I don't think that being dumb is chief among them or even really one that's a no, common factor. No, I've met some amazing people that um, that that are into conspiracies. But mo the, most of the people that I've run into that get into it, it, it how to describe it simply, it's a rabbit hole with a slippery slope mm -hmm. or rabbit holes. You know, because you fall in once you start getting into them, it's kind of like the Matrixy thing. You know, kind of that movie's so old now. Where, <laughs> where once you I don't get know in, if my students would even know that one anymore. No, yeah, the, Mat <laughs> the Matrix kids from 1999. <laughs> oh my god. Um, yeah, the red pill, blue pill thing, which is once you get past a certain point, once you lose the trust of the powers that be, where mm -hmm. whoever you want to call it, the authority of your day, be it a government or you know, an education system or whatever, once you lose that trust, it is very, very tough to to get back. Mm -hmm. And so the, I mean, but, but that same token, if you have, especially with the flatter stuff, if you have a master's degree, bachelor's degrees, we have a lot of people with bachelor's degrees in our community mm -hmm. and some with masters, almost none with PhDs though. So if you have a master's mm -hmm. degree in a physical science, really in anything, physical, I don't care if it's geology, hydrology, biology, whatever it is, flat earth, you're never, you've spent too much time. You, you, you've mm -hmm. been in too long. PhD is gone. I, I, I know very, very few PhDs. And, and in fact, no PhDs on our team that would go public mm -hmm. because, you know, the scariest thing from, uh, you know, from the high, you know, the high level educators, the scariest word ever is ostracized. Right. Mm -hmm. You get your peer group, you get published, you know, your papers, one or two, and then that's all you want. You want to stay in that circle and you never, ever want to leave it. And uh, and so it's, it's tough for even us for, for us to get debates, which is why sure. you didn't see a debate in that particular um, documentary. We've sure. had debates since then, but it's really it's like pulling teeth trying to get people to debate us. So it's it, it ties into something I was interested in. Uh, that you said in the documentary we watched was there's not scientists in the flat earth community because they can't be for sort of the same reason you just gave it's at a certain yeah. level of education particularly in the physical sciences it's it's a level of indoctrination was the argument yeah. and uh but what, what i thought was interesting that almost balanced it out and i'd like to get your thoughts on is several of the people including bob maybe chief among them in the the documentary uh approach it from rather you know there's some people who approach it from a religious standpoint primarily or spiritual right uh bob and jaron and others seem to approach it from a scientific standpoint let's test let's let's see what's observable let's see what's measurable yep. and scientifically prove that there's no curvature no rotation that sort of thing right um is the difference there just the level of education and how you know how many years have they spent in a system that could sway their opinion or is it the approach itself if that makes sense it's i wouldn't say necessarily well i mean education has something to do with it but it, but for them it's more curiosity uh because mm -hmm. people are people are funny people are lazy and the and because of that it gets what's, what's the old human question which is what is the uh, human being's most common state uh is it fear or laziness mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a tough one but, but i think it's laziness honestly because you know everyone you know we're mammals <laughs> we'd mm -hmm. love to just lie down all day and lots of people do um but for but for us jaron and bob and those guys it came down to the experiments were easy to do experiments that you did not see in the in the documentary uh, because they didn't want to show them well, to be honest they, they, they just didn't want they didn't want to go down those roads because like we're we're we can't give them anything you know we're not we're not they they tried to leave the nuts and the bolts out of it with the exception of jaron's experiment at the end which he just butchered by the way i gotta throw in jaron's experiment at the end which was because you know it was it was the stinger they they put at the end but then mm -hmm. i didn't know until months later that uh when jaron you know because jaron had a lot of hell for that at the end and because you know he invited him back twice once the the condenser on the laser melted and then the second time you know it, it seemed to be an issue with with elevation but then jaron goes out to the site during the middle of the day and i remember he was doing a, a live stream and he's going okay you know this is the first time i've actually been here during the day it's like what you never went to the site to check it out to see if you actually had line like to see if it was actually level and to his defense he says well google earth said it was level from here to there you know it's like i didn't know when he got down to the cold sack it was like there's all sorts of of level changes on the way it's like what you know which goes into the whole media thing you've heard it many many times like never do it the first time live 
Mm-hmm. Never, ever do it. Always do dry runs. It's like, oh, you know, the the, the common producer mistake, which is, oh, no, no, let's just bring the cameras, guys. We'll, you know, we'll do it live. It'll be fine. It'll absolutely be fine. It just turned into a disaster both times. So mm-hmm. anyway, sorry. When it came to, to Jaron and Bob, though, their curiosity was born. Um, Well, Bob, Bob was, was a really intelligent man, extremely intelligent uh, guy and his wife was really intelligent their son who ended up being a professional white hat at the age of 15 mm. it's just this, you talk about eugenics <laughs> i mean these two had a kid and he hacked fortnite like 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 the time he was barely 15 and then then sent his findings to a uh, forbes and the whole thing just turned into a nightmare because they had you know lawyers had to contact his parents because he wasn't even old enough to be contacted by lawyers directly it's like that might be your... the most 2020 sentence I've ever heard that a 15 year old white hat hacker hacked Fortnite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we did. He, he goes behind the scenes and he gra- and he grabs the new Christmas stuff that wasn't even released yet. He's going, oh, look at the new Christmas skinny skins mm-hmm. that they're going to do, blah, blah, blah. And then he, he takes a screenshot and he fires it off to Forbes magazine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's what you do. And he thought, well, they'll they'll blur out my name and my account number and stuff. No, no, they didn't. Mm-hmm. Do, they just posted it. And Fortnite's like, well, we know who this guy is. We banned. Yeah. <laughs> next thing you know, there's a FedEx FedEx thing. It's like cease and desist. But it was again dressed to your parents because you mm-hmm. weren't. I mean, straight out of the movies type deal where you weren't even old enough to be to be sued. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Your, your parents had to be caught. You had to get a note from your parents just to get. But anyway, the 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 silver lining there, not to drag that one out, is um, they ended up hiring him. Of course they did, right? Mm-hmm. That's what you do. If you find it's like you know, that's like the really bad, really bad what you did. Okay, we gotta hire this guy. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's like the movie moment where it's like we're only gonna hire the kid who can crack our own network. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what they did, and they were paying him like a grand a bug. It was just as a kid, you know, just from he didn't even have to go in the office. He just did it from his house. It's like whatever you find, like pay a grand a bug, whatever you find. And he was finding a bunch. Sure. Awesome. I was very happy for him. Anyway, sorry, it was kind of a long winded thing. No, but, no, no. I love the tangents. That's what but, I'm all about. But Jer- by the way, Jaron and Bob, the 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 movie did not touch any of the re- other religious angles, even though at least half of our community are on the religious side, you know, hard mm-hmm. hardcore Christians. Uh, because mainstream media just doesn't go down that road. I mean, I have done mm-hmm. way too many events where mainstream media, it's like we've got we've got people in the in the Christian community, bigger channels than me, and they won't talk to them because they be because you know they look them up and like Rob Skiba was a great example. It's like no, he's too churchy. It's like oh, all right, fine, I'll find somebody else, but they they wouldn't touch it. But, yeah, uh, but there's a lot of I mean, I there was there were, we even had Christian flat earth conferences that I wasn't invited to because I couldn't quote enough chapter and verse, hmm. which is just so bizarre to me. So I some people take that angle very seriously, very like. seriously, because, again, if it is built, if it is this right, mm-hmm. then it was built by someone. And mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that it's it's the God of your choosing, but it gets you one step closer to knowing God's phone number than you did before. Right. Is that one of Chris's models, by the way? Yes, that is one of he's Chris's from, models. He's, he's from, he's, he's a Dallas boy. He's from my hometown. He, I think he moved to Oklahoma recently. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, this is one of my, in fact, he built this model, especially for me, as uh, Pontius stuff on the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, he built this just for me because he didn't like the little model I was carrying on some of my TV interviews. And mm-hmm. so he's like, I'm going to send you a nine incher <laughs> that, so that you can put it in your bag so you can you you can carry this with you. And it's like, all right, cool. So I, I keep this by my desk. So, yeah. Who made the uh, the coffee table that we see in the documentary? <gasps> That was done by another guy. Um, not even a just a, 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 a I don't know. I wouldn't even call him a contractor, but he he worked with plastics and wood. He was he was okay, right? He wasn't Chris Pontius mm-hmm. though, and he showed up at the conference with all these tables. He drove them in, and all these freaking coffee tables. And then he and he wanted to send one to me, and he sent it all the way up here to uh, to Seattle. And I, the shipping must have been like three hundred dollars. I ended up giving it away to a um a, a couple that was um, up on the north end of the island. Gotcha. But uh, but that was kind of fun, uh, you know. Again, the fire community is very. There's a lot of artistic people in the community. You can mm-hmm. imagine, right? Creative minds tend to be more open minded. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of artists in just about every mm-hmm. media you can think of. Uh, singers, painters, 
tattoo artists, you name it. I mean, the, the <laughs> when we do the conventions, the tables are just this huge, you know, buffet of creative, you know, creativity We've done with a lot of people. So, yeah, it stuck out to me in the international conference clips we see and behind the curve, you've got like people doing, you know, everything from not that everyone's on the same level I, I suppose is Chris Pontius bringing in the flat earth writer and all of these impressive custom builds and stuff but you've got people doing art you've got people okay. who have music that they've written you've got people who've got displays with their kind of like test results and stuff on the more scientific side yep. you've got people who are making their religious appeals it was a, a, a wider spread I suppose than I initially expected in terms of like what kind of community is this going to be how are we going to do community outreach you have everything from Chris you know hitting them right with this is a flat earth writer and then it catches them off guard let's talk about it to people who are ready to present their scientific findings and it was it was an eclectic mix oh yeah and a, and a media person's dream i mean that first conference i think i was wearing three hot mics simultaneously at one point i we did not mm -hmm. know whose cameras were who mm -hmm. and we heard rumors of all these different pe people that were that um that had sent me you know because it was the first one of its kind and so, like, I remember, like, Howard Stern set the team down, but he wouldn't go himself because he didn't want to, you know, get, you know, because he would stick out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were people that flew in from just about everywhere to to shoot this thing. And the little documentary team that could, they were there. And it was weird because they were shooting other people, you know, and everyone, waivers were being signed everywhere because you're not supposed to even get the other guys on camera without waivers. Mm -hmm. it was so weird. But it was yeah. It was they they noticed that where before we watched the documentary, we did some kind of preliminary videos of like let's set the stage here, let's look at what this issue is because most of them had heard of the the flat Earth theory, but some of them hadn't, and even the ones who had, they hadn't heard of the documentary. They they weren't super well versed in it at all, and uh, so we watched an ABC News clip that was uh, the one with the reporter who was there and interviewed you at the yeah. conference in Raleigh. And yeah. they were like, Oh, that's the same reporter who we saw, you know, a week ago when we watched that. So yep. they were putting together all of the puzzle pieces and it was like that Avenger scene where everybody's coming together. You've got Chris coming out of his truck with the bike. You've got, you know, people bringing in their shirts and all that. And it was like, Oh, I remember this guy from Houston, this guy from Dallas. And Oh yeah. It yeah. was, it was a blast. I wouldn't have traded it in for the world. Um, and it was, our, it was our big moment to be like, Oh yeah, just so you know, this is happening mm -hmm. and it's not going away. And then after that, what, what the, the wave that happened after that, and I challenge anybody, all you have to do is like type in flat earth into YouTube and sort by, up like by by view count the mm -hmm. amazing number of channels i knew we were in trouble when by that i mean that it was getting outside of our control when um somebody said uh, oh yeah by the way you're on a pewdiepie thumbnail mm. i go what i go he didn't even interview us or me it's like and he he had stole he had stolen the image from a vice interview from the conference you know, and he, it, there was lots of people that were just because you know how it goes with media. Once it gets out there, people cobble together things. They didn't even call it flat earthers. They just steal from other people's flat earth clips. Mm -hmm. And then it just kept, it became cyclical to where now there are all sorts of kids that are reacting to flat earth videos on YouTube, putting them on TikTok. And then we're taking those and compiling them and putting them back on YouTube. And it just goes round and round and round and round. It never ends. Well, once you've made it onto the gaming YouTube channels, I think you've made it. So <laughs> that's the test, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I, 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 yes. It, 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 again, it's been a lot of fun, but uh, I can't wait to see where it goes from here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've had, so th there's a term that some of my students threw out of uh, main character syndrome that they were ascribing to a lot of people in the documentary of like, isn't it appealing to kind of be the focus of attention on something? Um, but they, but they talked about it in a few different contexts. So some of it was critical, like, okay, well, this seems like it's an attention seeking thing. Some of it was more contextualizing and better understanding uh, the mindset of people getting involved, like, well, no, it's not a misunderstanding or poorly educated or not intelligent or not right. curious or inquisitive, anything. Right. It's like, well, there's a draw, you know, to a sense of community um, and like-minded people who you can kind of feel um, that there's a reason why you're all gathered around together and um, adding some structure. And, um, but it seems like in some of the interviews I've seen with you that, you actively reject this idea that you're, you know, the, the, that humanity you, you accept is sort of the center of this model, but you individually, Mark Sargent, are not the the father of the flat earth movement or, you know, the, the sole originator of this idea or no, its leader no. or anything like that. Um, 
no okay first off let, yeah let me let me sort part of that out sure. which is first off flatter the you know, it was absolutely not my idea i had nothing to do with it um you could you know type in ty type in um uh ancient cosmologies into google mm -hmm. and hit images everybody you know drew the, the drew the same thing long thousands of years before i got i got here the the only thing i did differently was and part of it was the the software training and the the tech support training that i had, had for years and years was i boiled down a concept and turned it into a 101 book mm -hmm. that's all i really did i mean if you listen to the clues there's no math really in the clues there's it's just mm -hmm. connect the dots concepts you know with a steady narrative and i don't go off into the weeds too badly and I, I break it up into easy to digest pieces. Um, but if I if I you know die in a plane crash tomorrow, this thing keeps going. Mm -hmm. And that's why I try to, you know, and and I'm really happy when I see other people. I mean, Jaron, you know, took off Jar Jaron, I love his his story because he like he watched the flat earth clues and he didn't like my production at all. You know, it was my <laughs> me doing this slideshow. He's going. Oh, if this guy can do it. I absolutely can make better, better content than he can. <laughs> and he goes down to the second hand store. True story. And buys like an old copy of Visual Studio 12, right? For like six bucks or something mm -hmm. like that. Brings it home. I don't even know who supported on Windows at that point. And and he starts creating content and it starts generating, you know, for a lot of people, I'm older, but for a lot of people, it still comes down to the the hits and the likes and the subs. You know, I, I recommend anyone, especially young people, to to watch the the, the documentary Fake Famous. If you have mm -hmm. not seen it, watch it. You know, it is the currency. It, and I I go into I don't want to sidetrack too much, but the when people back in the day, back in the day, kids, when you say, "Oh, what do you want to be when you grow up?" Oh, I want to be an airplane pilot. I want to be a rock star. I want to be an athlete. Blah blah blah. No, everybody now says the same thing. It's all been very homogenized. Which is, no, I want to be famous. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, what do you want to be famous for? Because you got to be. It has to be for something. One of the five forms of art, right? You got to be some. Oh no, no 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 no! I just want to be famous. It's like, you mean like what? Paris Hilton? It's like, yeah, and for a lot of people, it's, oh, that sounds fine. <laughs> yeah, but that mm -hmm. was for her last name. You know, even she did something, which was not really much. So when it came down to that and, and every channel that, that got into it, a lot of the big channels that got into it got into it because they the, the word goes around. If you're a big channel, you look at the trends. And it's like, oh, by the way, if you make a Flat Earth video, dude, not only will you get a bunch of hits, mm. but the big thing was the because it's so polarizing, the comment section will go up by like an order of magnitude and so it then will, engagement's just super high oh yeah. You know, yeah and people just i mean it's if you've ever looked in the comment section like a big flat earth video oh people just tear into each other all day long and it's mm -hmm. and it's to where there's a lot of people that when they make their first flat earth, flat earth video they'll turn the comments off because oh yeah because they can't they can't bear it which is why patricia steer by the way in a follow-up kind of backed away from the community because she was one of those people she was older but she was very very social media conscious so and she told me I, I go you reading every freaking comment on every video you're making she goes and some of yours I'm going no 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 that's a terrible idea I go I go I don't read most of my comments I want to actually sleep at night mm -hmm. and, and I go you're gonna keep doing this she goes yep and she goes and I'm gonna sanitize them I'm going you're going to try to delete every negative comment in, in every video that you might go. What happens when you make a hundred videos? What happens when you make 200 views? You're going to snap. So, and she did. She finally, yeah. you know, after a certain number of years, uh, she just couldn't, she couldn't do it anymore to where yeah. they, were, they were just, they were too harsh. I mean, when you're, she was a triple threat and I'm trying not to be you know, all God's children, but she was an attractive Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. And on the internet, she's a, she's a big target on her back. And mm -hmm. she didn't, she didn't realize it. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, one of the first topics that we covered in the seminar class I teach is uh, before we got to the conspiracy mindset was misinformation, disinformation, that sort of thing. And we, they were particularly interested, I think, unsurprisingly, given that it's, it's where a lot of people spend so much of their time nowadays at the role that, that, that social media plays in the spread of misinformation and that's what we've what we sort of found is that in some examples we looked at um some studies we looked at it was time and time again the stuff that's the most divisive the stuff yeah. that's the most polarizing the stuff that is the most you know sometimes bitterly contentious is what gets the highest engagement which translates directly to the highest dollar amount for the people who create yep. it Absolutely. and for the platforms that host that content so it's yes. unsurprising that something like flat earth generates so many comments from people from bots 
um flatter a lot of content to work with we were promoted and i went you know i I, there's i've documented it very well on my channel which was we were promoted on youtube extremely aggressively for three years straight i mean non-stop and why wouldn't you people forget youtube is the biggest television network in the world oh it may be a lot of crappy content but it is lifetimes worth of content you know, you would never, you could spend a hundred thousand, you know, thousand lifetimes. You're never getting through all the, the, the content. There's like for every, what is it? Every minute of every day, there's like 80 hours. And that was mm-hmm. the content that's being put out there. So when YouTube was looking for a binge topic and there was this wonderful quote, it was on the um, a documentary called The Social Dilemma. And they were asking this programmer, like one programmer who was, he was in charge of what's recommended for you, you know, on the right hand side of YouTube. And it, it's like, it's like, what do you, what do you, what do you base that algorithm on? And think of this, right? Out of all the thousands and thousands of topic on YouTube, he chose one. You know what he said? He goes, well, if the average person that gets into Flat Earth for the first time watches like 20 videos in a row, what do you think I'm going to recommend? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. That's how the algorithm works. It's like, because once you, you know, the Flat Earth is so was so unique that the one thing went down the rabbit hole. People were like, it's like, no, no, I'm not going to work today. You know, and it's like they were just punching through these videos. And that's what YouTube wants to see. YouTube doesn't have a licensed binge worthy you know thing like netflix and hulu Mm -hmm. and and hbo max they have to go off certain things and we became their binge topic to where at one point they had to take their own foot off the gas Mm -hmm. because congress got involved you know there's Mm -hmm. this or the senate where they had that wonderful thing where youtube was like so we're gonna ban these and we're gonna recommend flat earth less the head of google you know is is saying this i'm going what (laughs) i'm watching this (laughs) on live television going that can't be good. And that's when the monetization just went, you know. Everywhere. Oh, yeah. There, there's always a fascinating ethical dilemma when you look at taking a process that's automated, like a site's algorithm. What kind of pro- what kind of content does it push individuals? And then let's get in there and manually adjust it. Right. Um, so you know, when do you manually adjust it? If you ever do, to what extent do you? So, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I want to come back real quick to the uh, that, that main character syndrome idea and, and seeing it in a, in a few different lights. Uh, one of my students had uh, what I think is a great question. We, we've we talked about the connection between the Flat Earth model and The Truman Show, which yeah. happens to be one of my very favorite movies. I have, I think, probably the camera's reversed, but I've got my little How's It Going to End. Oh, awesome. And, awesome. Yeah, I w- yeah. wear that on my coat. 1998, um, a fantastic movie. I saw it in the theater back then. Yep, yeah, and we're, uh, we're watching that in the class. Um, so, so everybody's going to get to see it. But anyway, so they've been interested. Some of them have seen the movie, some of them haven't. But uh, one of my students named Ash asked, uh, how do you feel like your life compares to Truman or other characters in the Truman show, if you see any similarities? And it ties into something they asked you in the documentary that I never saw an answer to because I don't know if they cut it out or what they happened. cut it out. They cut it out because there was, they asked I, about I, the mayor I, thing. Yeah, but but they and they they tried to throw some emotion in there, which was really weird because they were trying to turn it into a Truman show moment, which which the argument was, you know, Truman <clears throat> had to get out. Right. He was mm-hmm. the he was the star of the show. But imagine if you were. Um, if, if they if it was more than just Truman that was being deceived, right? Let's say it wasn't just Truman. Let's say let's say Truman was in this case the mayor of the town, which mm-hmm. they could have absolutely made him the you know, the mayor, right? You know, give him the power and and all this stuff. If he made it to the edge, does he leave? At one point, does the the comfort that where you are is it so comfortable that you're afraid? You know, it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know, mm-hmm. and that is. Okay, I know this world is fake, but it's pretty pretty comfortable. Do I still walk out that door? And there there really wasn't an answer there. I was asking basically the audience, what would you do if, mm-hmm. if that was the case? Is there a, is there a point where Truman is gets you know which really the the Truman Show there was some flaws in it in the in the writing, which was you know if I, and of course you know truth is they he never would have figured it out ever ever mm-hmm. in a million years. It was these, a series of accidents. But if he was in a position of power, would he have left? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. Um, if it was me, it, re- it that all comes down to where you, are, you know, the perspective you are in life. If I was 20, I don't know, maybe I might, because I was reckless. If I was 40, I don't know, maybe. It, oh, real quick. It looks like you went uh, invisible there. Oh, did again. I? Oh crap. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. You're fine. I hit to interrupt. Oh uh, yeah. It, Let's sorry. See. What? That's weird. Hang on. It was being great for a little while. Uh, that's all right. We'll get it. Okay. So there we go. um would would I have left would I have left probably but that's because um 
you know, I never got married and had kids. So the mm-hmm. leverage really wouldn't have been there for me to uh, to stay. I would have been like, you know, if I, if I was in a rut, sure. Do I feel like sometimes that I am actually in a Truman Show? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you get into Flat Earth, once that moment hits you, you know, where where you believe this weighs heavier on the scale. God darn it. <laughs> My face. Well, where this is actually weighs sure. heavier on the scale than the um, uh, than the solar system model. Then, yeah, you do feel like like you're in some sort of soundstage. And I've said that a bunch of times, which is, you know, I I, I, I talk. There's some things they, they wouldn't let me talk about in. God darn it. All right. I'm going to have to lean more towards the camera on this one. All right, let's just do, you know what, we'll zoom in. How about this? Uh, one sec. By the way, I've got about 30 more minutes. Is that okay? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Um, Let me look. Hang on. Logitech. I'm going to zoom in my camera. Logitech camera settings. You'll see me zoom in for a sec. Ready? Ah, there we go. There that we go. Should, that, that should help. Uh, hoping. Good um, for now, at least. So what was what was the um the question? Well, so so the the thing that I was interested in is the 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 I think it's the director of the documentary kind of flips it around and says, well, wouldn't you say that you're in a sense the mayor of flatter? Oh yeah, yeah, no, and, analogy, I, I, and we don't see an answer. And I was no, curious no, no. about and, what that and was, and that's because I and and a lot of people, you know, first off, you know, people said because I wore the I am Mark Sargent shirt, there's got to be an ego thing there. No, that oh, is sure. a that is a rip off from the 1999 movie uh, Fight Club which is somebody came up with it for me, which was uh, uh, when Robert Paulson died, was played by Meatloaf. Uh, it was like, you know, he didn't have a name. And, it, and it's like when they found out his name, it's like his name is Robert Paulson. His name is, if you remember that movie. And then it was like, we're all Robert Paulson. And so it's like, you know, at one people kept trying to push me into a leadership role, like an ultimate leadership role. I'm going, no, 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 we're not doing that David Koresh type thing. That's not going to happen with me. Uh, you know, I, I, I have said, and, and I changed since the documentary was, I'm the freshman recruiter. If flat earth is a university, I am the one-on-one book. I am the recruiter that shows you around the campus and walks you around. It's like, yeah, yeah, we do experiments over there. And that's where we slam NASA over there. That's our music department. That's our art department, (laughs) blah, blah, blah. Have fun kids. Right. And then you never see me again. Right. Until Mm -hmm. you see another class walking around with me. And, and it's true because again, if you have, to use a movie a reference movie from uh, from um, blow <laughs> if if you get into flat earth there's an 80 percent chance i just make it up this number that uh you ran into my stuff first mm-hmm. or you, because you because you, because mine was the introductory stuff so no as far as me being the mayor of flat earth no and in the documentary they actually put it in the corners like oh king of flat earth and i think they did that to piss off matt boylan the yeah the, the very loud guy in there who wanted to be flat earth he he and that all that story was absolutely true, which was he was just this aloof artist from Canada that so wanted. And, and he was like, no, no, I'll talk to the media when I'm good and ready. It's like, who are you, Prince? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, you know, no media. And then and then what happened was people were talking, you know, b- people I I was the go between and people said, well, do you want to be interviewed about flat? It's like, yeah, sure. Why not? And after a while, once people don't understand the producers are really lazy the interns are very very lazy so it's like hey we need to interview somebody about flat earth they type in if they can't if they whoever the first person they find in the first 10 minutes and they and i heard this over and over it's like oh yeah i listened to like like a snippet of your interview from blah 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 and that's why i'm talking to you and and then matt's like why isn't anybody talking to me and by the time Mm -hmm. he got around to putting himself out there it was over uh, mm-hmm. You know, people, we were, we, the, our bus had already, you know, started heading down the road and there was nothing you could do. So, well, we no, did our I, best. I, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say we did our best in all of our conversations to like first rule of our class is every conversation is a discussion, not a debate. And we keep things respectful and we show each other empathy and kindness, all of that. There was a lot of comparisons of Matt's clips in the documentary to the new Batman movie and the Riddler videos that he makes calling on his, his supporters. There was somebody said one of my students sent me a message on our on Microsoft Teams and was like, uh, go to this, go to 129 in this clip. And it was almost shot for shot. One of Matt's videos where he picks up the camera and uh he's saying, you know, I let you call me crazy, I let you call me delusional. And so we had a we did have a fun time kind of. Matt, uh, by the way, is absolutely 
amazing on camera and i i lost count of how many producers tried you know tried to track him down through me mm-hmm. it's like you can get a hold of matt and there I, i'll give you a quick story um which was there was a early on true television a true television producer that that back in 2015 she absolutely knew where this is going she was absolutely ahead of this thing and she she asked me at one point it's like oh so how how can i you know do you have matt boylan's phone, phone number and i go yeah but you, you you're not going to want to make that call and mm-hmm. she goes, no, 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 I can handle them. Like I'm a, I'm a veteran producer. She was like in her twenties. I'm, I'm a veteran producer. I can do this. I'm like, okay, let's see how this goes. And I sent her the number the next day she calls me back and I get this. It's like, so why didn't you warn me? <laughs> you, <laughs> <I> tried. Tried. <laughs> you weren't having it. There are some lessons that have to be lived. They cannot be taught. And yeah. she goes, she goes, he was amazingly just so out there that uh, she, she was like trying to create a reality show where like most of the team was going to be doing their things and he was going to be basically on his own somewhere mm-hmm. else because she goes he does not play well with others I go no anyway so she made this big pitch reel to the New York group in, in true television and you can imagine right this is 2015 not many people knew what the heck was going to flat earth and you can imagine the big long table what do you got Rebecca Rebecca's like I'll show you what I got flat earth ba, 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 ba. Mm-hmm. You know, cut to black, lights go up. She was fired. Oh, gosh. <laughs> because it's like, well, I don't know where your head is at. So fast forward to when Netflix picked up behind the curve and the VP that fired her contacted her. And they said, and she said, look, I am so sorry. But again, I mean, it's the nature of the business. Producers are paid to say no. Mm-hmm. You know, they get tons of ideas, throwing them all day long, and most of them are terrible. And in this case, what would you have produced Flat Earth? I don't wouldn't know. Is a television show? It still is not a television show yet. So right. Well, pun intended. She was ahead of the curve on that one. But yes, she, uh, was. <laughs> she was. Yeah, I yeah with Matt's stuff. I mean, we we had that was where we kind of cut loose a little bit more and had more fun with. Uh, they they created a cast list where we were picking. It's multi levels here. It was which people from the class were going to play people who were featured in the documentary but those people in the documentary were playing characters from batman so we had matt was the joker or riddler type character it could uh, be either yeah we had mark Sargent as bruce wayne slash batman we had <laughs> unsurprisingly they, they went that route but anyway so yeah, they had fun i'm, with I'm that a big one. superhero fan by the way i've got mm-hmm. uh comic book art on the walls and i i used mm-hmm. to i briefly owned a comic book store in uh, college back in the day oh that's very cool yeah, yeah, I, a lot of weird things, but uh, but that was yeah. So I'm a big superhero movie fan. So yeah, yeah. The, the Matt the Matt Joker Riddler references are absolutely true, and they never did interview him. They tried twice, mm-hmm. and then you saw that fade to black where Matt's demands were listed mm-hmm. on the screen, and that was absolutely true. The other thing mm-hmm. was absolutely true, which we won't get into because we, we I you know for time's sake is that story you know where he was at the 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 NASA guy's house out in the Hamptons during the whole thing where the guy drew the flatter thing on the floor. Mm-hmm. But, absolutely accurate there was the only sober interview he ever did by his girlfriend it was brilliant and do i did he work for nasa no did he work for a guy who worked for nasa yeah yeah and people people tend to you know when it comes to uh, the mark twain famous quote which i love so much which is never let the truth get in the way of a good story which is if you can remove a degree of separation so Oh yeah, did you hear about the the people that were on that bus crash to where oh no no I was on that bus when it crashed, right? Mm-hmm. Because it sounds better when you're on it. So Matt was like, "Oh no, I worked for NASA." It's like, well, technically you got your money from a NASA guy, but mm-hmm. it wasn't you you weren't, you know, doing stuff for NASA directly. You weren't getting if you could show me a pay stub from NASA, I'd love to see it, but we're not going to. Anyway, sorry, go on. No, 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 you're good. Um one that I was interested to talk about a, a lot of my students have uh understandably because I, it's one of the big issues of today is have taken an interest in the environment environmentalism climate sure. change all of those sort of topics and so they've done research papers they've done argumentative papers they've done presentations powerpoints all sorts of stuff on yeah. from different angles they've looked at biomimicry um you know like how we can emulate uh natural adaptations from animals in like human life city engineering urban planning all these different cool angles yeah. but because it's kind of a keen interest i've seen across all of my classes thinking through thinking of the earth through a, a different model being the flat earth model which we'll just use the domed model as the, the probably the most popular one as opposed to the the different camps that exist yeah. but within that system 
do you feel like environmentalism has a role, like sort of taking care of the environment within that enclosed system or is yes. it, it okay. Yeah, yeah, what does yeah. that In look fact, like then? I had, I had a whole bunch of people that were asking me, it was, I was really surprised because I never brought it up. And we don't, a lot of people in our community don't bring it up. And mostly it's about climate change, mm -hmm. which was, does climate change work in a flat earth model? I go, well, yeah, if it's a snow globe, I go, if mm -hmm. we're living in a big building with walls and a floor and a ceiling, then everything that we're doing in here, even if it's an automated system with like an air filtration system and, and all sorts of ventilation, it's only going to be able to compensate so much. Mm -hmm. uh, no different than uh, if you bring in like a, if you have a car, if you're sitting in a car and you have the air conditioning running and somebody brings in a propane lantern and puts it in the back right? Well, that's going to change the dynamics of what's going on in that car and then put two lanterns and then put three. Pretty soon, doesn't matter how car that's, you know, hard that thing is working. There's going to be weird hot spots and cold spots and all the other stuff. And what I try to remind people is, because um, I do believe in climate change, I do. Um, even though they used to call it, I, I personally prefer global warming because that's what we used to call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the media through directives changed and now you don't hear it so much, which is if there are roughly let's just round to any sort of number, like 700 million internal combustion engines running at any given point, you know, during the day, you know, during a 24 hour period, that's a huge, I mean, people forget the, the engine in your car is just a furnace. That's all it is. It's, it's a furnace that's hooked up some gears, right? It could, if you hook up that same engine to your house, you could heat your house very easily mm -hmm. uh, with that thing. And, uh, ah, I zip, I disappeared for a second there again. Um, Damn human technology. <laughs> we try to blend in on this planet. Yeah. Well, we're going to work with it. Let's see. Yeah, it's, it looks like in and out a little bit. Uh, you know, it's weird because I've got a green screen right behind me. But okay. Anyway, sorry. Um, what, what other questions you got? So um, another one of my students, I'm trying to give some shout outs when I can. So Colby was curious about what implications you suppose that a broad acceptance of the flat earth model would have on the lives of everyday citizens. Well, that's one of the, oh God. okay. You guys are going to have to deal with my, my uh, hidden head for now. That's Sorry, all right. That. That'll work. Well, audio know. is what's important here. I do not know why it's like, I look what happens when I turn that off. Oh yeah, it's doing an effect on the side. Yeah, I turn off that light, and you can see the green screen. I bet you if I do it over here, yep, it's, it's even worse. <laughs> Whatever. We had, okay. we had one eyeball for a second. <laughs> yeah, you guys are gonna have to. I'm really here. I'm not on a spaceship. <laughs> swear to God, probably. Can you guys fix that? We're gonna have conspiracy theories developing. Yeah, I know. There's gonna this be conspiracy now. theories. This, this actually happened during the memorial I was at, and people in oh, chat yeah. were going, "What's happening with Mark's head?" You know, you don't want to do this this many times, like in front of the conspiracy crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so what would it do if it would it change people's lives? Like, why keep this a secret? So if this if we found out uh, in 1960, if our base, we're basically talking about a secret that uh, even our best and brightest didn't figure out till 1960, which was because we didn't have the tech to to do it. So if you don't figure it out until 1960, uh, what this world, what if I do that? You know what? We're going to do that. Maybe if I hold my hand there. So I swear to God. Okay. So <laughs> if if you don't figure it out until 1960, your best and brightest don't figure it out. Uh, what, you know, the Illuminati meeting, what happens, right? It's like, yeah, somebody, you know, it's like, well, okay. It's a three pronged thing. First off would be, um, Education, everything you well, mentioned earlier, everything with anology, you know, biology, geology, hydrology, archaeology, everything with anology would have to be retooled. Libraries would have to be emptied and it would be chaos, right? Not to mention astrolo astrology, astronomy and astrophysics would be decimated, right? That, and who knows when those things would return. And that's every university in every country. That is an academic apocalypse, right? Then you've got the, the world markets that have to be suspended basically indefinitely even though it's a stock market and I don't think it'd be that much of a loss personally you suspend it. Cause you don't know what the markets would mean. You know, what would, what would happen to those markets? But the big one would be uh, the religious side, which was you're handing mm -hmm. the, the five major religious houses of the world, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christ Christianity, and all the variants thereof um, ammunition against science mm -hmm. leverage against science. You're asking them to hold restraint, even though science has been beating them over the head with textbooks for the last uh, of what, five centuries at least. Mm. Uh, it's not going to happen. I mean, science would be hard, hard pressed to to recover from that. And by that, I mean, I'm trying, making an attempt here to, whatever. I'm going to have to do this from a different browser because I got another podcast after this. 
um, which is the you know the the religious all those religious houses would go. It's like okay, so you were wrong about something really important. It's like what you know what? Let's revisit some stuff. Like I don't know, carbon dating and evolution and the Big mm. Bang and dark matter. I don't know and everything in between. And it would be it would be I don't know if science could recover. So you rattle off those three things. You know, Illuminati meet. It's like what's the worst that could happen? And then somebody like me chimes in. It's like well that. And then the guy at the end who's always smoking for some reason he goes so. Yeah, we're we're not going to be touching this for a while. We're going to put a pin in this, and mm-hmm. that was it. And that's it. We, you, they, and they don't touch it because remember, if you don't figure out, and the big reason is if you don't figure it out till 1960, civilization's already built. All the systems are in place. the The infrastructure is set up. Everything's kind of where you want it. And people in um, that's so weird. I'm trying to figure this out. People in power do not like taking risks like that. They don't take chances. Mm-hmm. so that's that's my answer okay no it's a you, good you answer can't, and, and... why why would you in fact i i I'll, I'll drop a name i mentioned that that, that was a question that um piers morgan asked me and mm-hmm. i i was waiting for that question i i asked him i go so tell me you'd break that story really would you <laughs> knowing that people might actually there's a chance that people might run through the streets with pitchforks and torches and just start burning things down you're really gonna do that I go look. The, the the there's a reason why the purge, the movie, the, the purge was never going to happen in real life. It's the insurance companies; mm-hmm. they're not going to let that happen, you know, because people would just start turning, you know, setting buildings on fire. Sure, yeah, and then so that was kind of like you covered it, but the lead in after how it would affect the everyday citizen is what about world cultures? What about political systems, economic <sighs> systems, and you know, obviously that stuff that we we talk about in in classes being interconnected. Um, it would so... it would change it would change everything. You'd have two group. Let's say a giant golden spaceship landed uh, near your school, right? Two, and, you know, and and be, two groups of people would show up. You'd have the nerds. Well, the military doesn't count. You know, there'd be a group. It's like we must shoot them, right? You, the people that aren't going to shoot them. The two groups. One would show up, and be the, all the nerds being like, "Oh wow, they do look like the blue people from Avatar." <laughs> you know, the and the other people would be like, "We must worship the blue people." You know, and mm-hmm. they start building churches. I mean, it would be this, you know, this, you aren't the, the true power unless you're the true power. Sort of like why um, the Air Force is never going to admit what, uh, you know, what spaceships, you know, are flying around really are. Because you can't rule the skies if you don't rule the skies. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, you can't just come out and say, oh, yeah, there's some things out there and they're way better than us. <laughs> all of a sudden mm-hmm. your military loses huge amounts of credibility, which is also tough for the the, the government to say, um, oh, yeah, by the way, we, you know you know we you know we're the ultimate power but the snow globe you're living in yeah we had nothing to do with that so mm-hmm. and you immediately lose lose credibility as an uh, as a power and people don't do that i mean i think it's easy to see how the various systems that you know govern the different states across the world are interconnected and something that we discussed of you know everything in a, in a class that's called social impact seminar you realize very quickly everything's connected the course yeah. format is basically most of our class time is based on uh having socratic seminars you know discussions rigorous like student-led discussions but right. the other component of the course is going up to a cork board and building out a little conspiracy connections board of our own where it's like okay we're looking at misinformation how does this then play into this other topic so we have you know color-coded strings for types of connections all these right. sorts of things and one of the kind of spider web interconnectivity things that's that some of my students brought up is like well how do conspiracy theories like flat earth connect to other conspiracy theories and i think that there's a, a decent argument to be made that certain conspiracy theories can unlike what uh, i would argue unlike flat earth by itself can kind of lead to some direct harm for certain people especially if the conspiracy theory is more based on like an unfair characterization or stereotype of say an identity group. Sure. And as opposed to calling into question core aspects of our reality, we're calling into question the character, the morality, something like that of an identity group. Um, so if we were for the sake of argument, acknowledging a connection between the conspiracy mindset and conspiracies that are fairly innocuous versus some that might lead to more harm. Like, do you see a line that can be drawn somewhere? And, and for you personally, I've seen you speak in interviews about how discovering this flatter theory has actually helped you have even more empathy for people, treat people more gently, call into question, why would we ever fight? Why would we go to war? Right. Um, you know, so long-winded question, but the, the idea is 
Do you see that connection? And if so, where do you think we could kind of draw a line to keep it from reaching something that could potentially be dangerous? Good point. Um, I was initially worried, um, and I got to leave here in like 10 minutes. Sure, um, that's fine. I, I was initially worried when I when I first threw this flatter thing out there because I was worried that a percentage of the population was going to react badly to this, you know, to where they were going to feel claustrophobic and they might freak out and just start going on killing. Never happened, which was nice. And I think that was even though we condensed the universe from this massive, you know, unscalable thing down to a studio apartment, a very nice studio apartment, when it happened, it was jarring, but it was comfortable enough where simultaneously people thought oh, okay well i'm in a giant studio apartment oh wait that means it was made by somebody and that's somewhat comforting exactly so it's, it's sort yeah. of balanced that out which is why yeah for me um the empathy was my empathy grew by a lot and that's saying something because i was in um high level support for a number of years and that was part of my job was was empathy mm -hmm. which was if we are here then we're all here you know in the same building and <clears throat> I couldn't even yell at people that weren't into flat earth because I was them. I'd, I'd have journalists try to get a rise out of me. You know, it's one of the things journalism journalists do. And, and one guy was really, he got worked up and he goes, <clears throat> I'm working at you for 40 minutes in the hot sun. You're not breaking. And I said, why would I, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, five years ago, I was you. So it'd be hypocritical for me to yell at you. I, uh, everybody starts out hating flat earth. Everybody does. So if we are all in one big giant building, then we are all here for a reason. It's very, very deliberate. And I'm a big believer. I always have been that God doesn't make mistakes. It took a while for me to make that totally encompassing to where, because when you, again, if you never get married or have kids, you get to look at a lot of systems. And I looked at a lot of things analytically. It's like, okay, this fits, this fits, this is interacting with this. And by the time it was done, I was like, wow, this place is way more organized than I thought it was. And no, mm -hmm. there aren't any mistakes. Everything's there for a reason. I'm a big believer. Um, so I got to get this out there in dualism, big believer mm -hmm. in dualism, if you know what that is, which is you cannot appreciate something without the opposite of the other light mm -hmm. without shadow, hot without cold, pain without pleasure, uh, order without chaos. And so everything and all and all the different spectrums, everything fits into that in, in some way or the other. And uh, is this world a, a work in progress? Yes, but this is not the first iteration, not by a long shot. So it's pretty, it works pretty, pretty well right now. Do I think, yeah, do, like with anything, do some conspiracy groups end up, you know, going down the dark path? Yes, there's, you know, before Flat Earth came along, yes, Flat Earthers were, you know, dark and mysterious. And we all talked like Batman and stuff. And the, you know, black hats and, you know, tw you know, twirl handlebar mustaches. But but flat earth, the reason why there's so many women into flat earth is because it's a message of hope. Right. If this place is built, it was built for a reason. And, mm -hmm. you know, th there's a deliberate, you know, act of kindness happening here, an act of creation. And I'm not even going down the biblical path. I'm just saying that that's what it feels like. And so, the you know, even though most conspiracy groups are 90 percent men, flat earth is more like high 60s, low 70s. And I know this because I go to the meetups and the conferences and there's lots of husband and wives and, and, you know, groups of women. It's like, that's awesome. So, I mean, they're not there for me. So, mm -hmm. anyway. well, um, I want to respect your time and let you get, no, no, going I, here I, got, your, I, got a few, other... I got a few more minutes. What? Okay. Uh, perfect. Um, so this is one that I'm sort of borrowing from the documentary itself um, that it was the, uh, I believe he was a psychiatrist posted, but it wasn't to uh, an individual person. It was this idea what kind of evidence would make you review your position? Because the documentary primarily shows tests that are done by people within the flat earth community. Right. Um, it doesn't really spend much, if any time on the catalog of evidence, you know, for the, the globe model that exists, because I think I would suspect from the documentary's point of view, it's, well, that exists, that can be, that can be seen. Um, so let's focus then on instead letting them speak for themselves. Right. So because the documentary has an absence of conflicting evidence, um, other than just expert testimony, what kind of evidence might make you rethink things? Got it, got it. We'll do this and then we'll we'll wrap up however you sure. want to wrap up, which is, so people have asked me this a bunch of times, which is, is there anything that could convince you to renounce Flat Earth? <laughs> and in fact, it, it was funny because in the documentary, they were kind of hinting, it's like, would you even do it if you did get hit with that evidence? Like, yeah, of course I would. Nobody wants to get into Flat Earth to, for anything. I mean, this, it just took me. Flat Earth just, I didn't ask to do Flat Earth. Flat Earth found me and I do not to this day, I mean, 
for a reason, apparently. But the, the two things, one is cheap, one is expensive. Uh, the expensive one first is get any camera on any rocket that's going to leave orbit, point it down, you know, attach it to the side capsule, not stage one, not stage two, the top thing that's going to leave orbit, point it down, turn it on, do not let it, you know, cut out and send that sucker off and then let us watch the footage. It's never happened in the history of space travel, statistically almost impossible. In fact, one would have thought with that Tesla Roadster in space, a whole nother argument for another time that uh that we would have gotten you know seen something along those lines and no absolutely not it was edited to all hell but the other one which is a simple test and i put out the challenge there for um god three or four years at least which was the spacesuit test which is thermodynamics if you know anything about physics uh pressure cannot n exist to non-pressure without a barrier and if that barrier is soft you can go into youtube and put, put anything in a vacuum chamber basketball football can of soda whatever it is it's going to you know stretch and then detonate that's what it does right there's only one object in the history of anything that had soft objects never done that it's the spacesuit okay um i know a few things about physics tell me what in that mystery backpack was uh that that stops that counteracts the vacuum of space it, it again defies the law of thermodynamics and and not only that tell me how they did it in 1969 Right. Mm -hmm. This backpack not only does the, the oxygen and, and uh, carbon filtering and I don't know where the nitrogen's coming from, but that's a whole other thing and heating and cooling. But tell me what what stops the vacuum of space. No one will explain it. And it is the most brilliant sleight of hand I've ever seen, which was up until the launch, all the the early suits were these huge plastic, bulky and metal things. Right. And they're going, this is never going to look good on camera at all. Plus, you're never going to get us. You know, how are they even going to climb anything? Right. Some guy goes, dude. Nobody's in physics club. Physics clubs are tiny in schools. Math clubs are tiny. All we have to do is use a soft suit, put it on television. It'll be fine. No one will question. Even the nerds won't question it. And they didn't. It was absolutely fantastic. One, one last thing I got to mention, which is when I, when I address people outside of this country, in America, it's like, why do you believe in the moon missions, right? In America, uh, people, it's like, wave the flag, rah, rah, we're the best. You know, you have to, you have to, to, um, to do that. I swear to God, I keep phasing it out, but that's fine. Um, Dana Perino from Fox News, one of the scariest things I ever heard on television, but I, I get it, you know, conformity builds empires, which she goes, she goes, I, she was quite, you know, she was talking about flat earth and the moon missions. And she goes, I believe in the moon missions because I'm a patriot. I was yeah. like, okay, so you believe in it because the government told you to believe in it and because you were a press secretary for George Bush. I get it. Okay, it's fine. But when I'm outside of this country, I say, hey, you know, I was in a thing in Sweden. And I say, hey, Swedes, why do you believe the Americans went to the moon? I go, I know why we think we went to the moon. Why do you think that we, the Americans went to the moon? And they all say, it doesn't matter what country I'm in. They all say the same thing. It's like, well, because it was on television. And the, the U.S. news would never lie about anything. I said, really? <laughs> do you know us? Very, we're Americans. We lie about everything. Yeah, the, the different approach across cultures is interesting. I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, and and it, seriously, it was because it was on television. And it's like the mm -hmm. Americans are totally legit. I mean, we pushed our brand out there. Sorry, last story, and then I got to go, which is um this will this will this will kind of make sense. This is a side story, but you'll get this, which is uh, when I was in Egypt uh, for a completely different thing, and I was at the Queen's Temple, and there was a bunch of school kids walking up to me, surrounding me. It had nothing to do with flat Earth, right? They didn't know me from Adam, and I go. Um, uh, it's, you know why this does it? Because the camera hates me. Oh, well, <laughs> It's a personal thing, really. It's a personal thing. Seriously, I've had photographers look at their cameras. It's like, what the hell's wrong with my camera? I go, I know you took like 300 <laughs> shots. Can't find a good one. There are photogenic people. And then there's me. I'm like 164th vampire on my, my dad's side. <laughs> pretty sure. So like, mirrors and cameras, they're horrible. So anyway, I was at the Queen's Temple. All these kids were walking around me. And this was before Flat Earth. I, you know, and it's like, what the heck's with these kids, right? Why are they swarming me? It's like, oh, well, you're the first American that we that they've seen outside of television. And I go, and? And they go, well, you know, you're the new world, you know, America. It's this wonderful, wonderful place. I go, what television are you watching exactly? What do they air <laughs> over here? And they go, you know, all those American programs. Dallas and Knott's Landing and Falcon's Crest and all these all these wonderful shows. This is about, you know, these are 80s and early 90s shows. Shows about um, America, all these Americans living in these amazing mansions in the middle of these you know massive tracts of land. You know, Americans all is are mostly millionaires, right? And I go, that would explain a few things. 
there's some a misunderstanding her, her there. Russians are still rock stars to some people in the world, and they, mm -hmm. you know, which is why we are the second language of the world. You have your default language of your country. Second language is almost always English. Mm -hmm. All right, that's I got it. one more. I have one more super quick one. If that's what all right with you. What is so, it? do you feel like in your life that the the main agent of control is yourself or an outside force? Ooh. That's a tough one. Um, I don't know if I can do this quickly, but I'll have you. I'll, I'll have you guys look it up. Sure. Which is um, there's a there's a, do, okay. I think it's an outside force. Do do I think we have free will? <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't. There's a wonderful wiki thing, but you can look it up. There's wonderful stories uh, called uh, neuroscience and free will. Fantastic experiments that were done years ago, where they hooked up electrodes to people's heads and they had them watch a computer screen. They were watching a number, you know, that was that was calculated on a screen, and and they um said okay pick a number between one and nine and hit that key on your keyboard and then on top of it note even before you hit it on the keyboard if you took any time between the time you chose it and the time you hit it on the keyboard and most of the time it was instantaneous right think of a number between one and nine it's like four right it's like barely mm -hmm. even a second between the time you pick it and the time you click it what was weird was the computer even though it didn't know what number you were going to pick knew that you were you had already made the decision to choose that number eight seconds ago before mm. the question was even asked. <laughs> and it's like, so that goes into the whole predestination thing, which scientists hate. It's like, hey, it was your experiment. We didn't come up with it, which is, are we living into your question? Are we living in a free system or are we living in a pre-recorded scripted thing where you made all the choices ahead of time. You picked the journey ahead of time, and then you blocked the memory before you got here. Possibly. And that. so do I, yeah, it, look that up if you get a chance. It's fascinating. Sure, yeah. But uh, do do I think, no, I do I do I think we have complete free will here? No, I think we made the decisions before we got here, long before we got here. In fact, I'll make one more reference, and then I've got to get out of here. Um, sure. Which is, uh, uh, this goes into the thing. So, People, kids are so lazy, not picking on your kids. Kids are so lazy. That sometimes they don't even play their own video games. They'll watch videos of people playing video games. It happens all the time. It's like, oh, I'm going to watch three hours of this guy playing Fortnite, right? And you get, neurologically, you get almost the same experience from watching this, depending on what screen you put it on, as if you were playing it yourself. What you don't realize is, is how little the resources are you are using to do that. You're just watching a little MP4 movie. It is tiny just compared to bear this. You're not watching a real time network thing. That's all this stuff happening, you know, across multiple systems. You're watching a tiny little movie. Well, who's to say that's not what you're in right now. Well, it's a good place to leave it. I think. There you go. Anyway, well, thank you. Yes. Um, no, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. I know my students are going to be absolutely fascinated to watch this. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it in the email, but you're comfortable with me uh, sharing the recording with my classes. Absolutely. Have fun okay. with it. Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll do. Thank you so much. I hope you have a good time at the, the next podcast and that Thank everything you. goes well. And uh, I will see you around. All right. Have a good one. You too. Thanks. Bye -bye. Hello, Daisy. Hello, Maggie.